Our keynote speaker is coming from USA, has trained over 10,000 people. There are countries with smaller population. He has worked in more than 100 companies, so let's say he has been around. A board member of Scrum Alliance and former founder of Agile for All, that's why he's known as Agile Bob. Please welcome Bob Hartman. Why 21st century leadership and agility go hand in hand. Good morning, thank you everybody. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks to the sponsors and organizers for asking me to come and speak to you this morning. Uh, as you know, my topic is leadership. But before we take it into that, I want to talk a little bit about myself because everyone always asks me how I got the name Agile Bob. So here's the real story so you don't get it from anybody else. Uh, my very first client forgot my last name. And they kept sending meeting invites to me that said, meeting with Agile Bob. I didn't really like the name, but after 30 days of this, I was getting kind of tired of it. And so I looked on Google. I said, who is Agile Bob? And they had already started writing articles that Google was picking up, and they simply called me Agile Bob. So obviously, Agile Bob had to stay as my nickname. But here's the thing. I have bad hips, so I hadn't had my first hip replacement yet. So I was being called Agile Bob while walking with a cane. <laughs> so a little bit odd there. But um, the topic of leadership in the 21st century is something that I find really fascinating, because we have leaders and others that are leading the same way we've been leading for the past 100 years. And yet we're doing things in a very different way. So this presentation is about saying, what do we need to change to become better leaders, have better leadership in our organization, and maybe walk away with a few tools to use? So the first thing is, why is the 21st century so different? There's a word that I'm going to put on the screen that kind of almost sounds like it's Serbian, VUCA. Um, but it doesn't, it's not an actual word. It hits an acronym, and the V stands for volatile. In the 21st century, the world is far more volatile. Things change quickly. So as a result, using old management techniques, okay, I have to get approval from this person and this person and this person and this person. By the time we do that, the other company has already delivered the product. So we're volatile today. There's also a high degree of uncertainty in the world. Outcomes are less predictable. We have a hard time understanding what is supposed to happen and when and why. And part of that is due to the complexity in the world. There are a lot more system variables in the world today, and they make a huge difference for us. I, I read a statistic a few weeks ago that said a company in the year 2000 compared to a company in the year 2018, in 2018, they have to analyze one million more times of data, a million more times of data in order to come up with their answers. That's complex. And lastly, there's a high degree of ambiguity. The meaning is a bit unclear at times. Do I do X because it gets me this, or do I do Y because it gets me this? And both could be good answers. The problem is, which one do I pick? So uh, can we get our first question, please? My first question, somewhere. Uh, which of these uh, variables is actually the one that uh, is difficult for you, for your companies? Is it volatility, uncertainty, complexity, or ambiguity? Which of those types of things, which one would be the most important for your company or the most difficult for you to deal with? I'll give you a few seconds for coming up with some results. I don't know how this works. We'll find out together. But while we're waiting, let me tell you that um, in my experience, the problem that we run into the most is actually complexity. And the reason is people are complex. And complexity means we can't analyze the situation and come up with an answer. For example, let's imagine that you were standing right here next to me, and I gave you a gentle nudge on the shoulder. You would react in a particular way. And if I did that again, you would react in a very similar way. How many times would I have to push you on the shoulder before you would react in a very different way? You would eventually say, what's going on? You might hit me. You might do something else. But you would not be sitting there taking it very long. That's the, an example of complexity. And because we're people, we are automatically complex. And that complexity makes it very difficult for us to deal with the world. And complexity came up as our number one answer. So that's great. Uh, let's go back to the presentation now. 
And let's look at some examples of how VUCA has shown itself in business. Number one, the average lifespan of a company on the Standard & Poor's 500. Almost 100 years ago, they would last almost 100 years, those companies, the average lifespan. Today, the average lifespan is, I believe, 12 years. Companies are being bought and sold at a tremendous rate. They're going out of business at a tremendous rate, as this next slide will show. Some companies in the United States, I couldn't come up with companies in Europe, but Enron you've probably heard of, a WorldCom, Blockbuster, Kodak cameras. All of these companies went out of business because they couldn't react fast enough to the changes in the marketplace. And today, we still have many changes going on in the marketplace, such as this one, autonomous cars. How is that going to change the world? Now, I will tell you one way it'll change the world is dramatic. All these streets out here will have a lot less traffic, right? Because autonomous cars will know where each other are. They can avoid each other. They can make traffic go more smoothly. Um, but that's a big deal. And we have an, a situation in the world today that's, been un, that's unprecedented. Two people working in a garage can disrupt a billion-dollar industry. And we've seen it happen over and over again. Uber and Lyft. Uh, Airbnb, all these companies that start up very small and they have disrupted tremendously large industries. I believe Uber now gives more dollars worth of rides than every cat taxi company in the world combined, and they own no taxis. Airbnb rents out more rooms in the world than, anybody, than any other hotel chain, and they own no hotels. These are ways that we're really disrupting business and reasons why we have to lead in a different way. Agile is part of an evolution. If you go back 100 years, you'll see that every 20 years, we make a difference in the world. In the 1910s, so almost a little over 100 years ago, we started with something called Taylor's Scientific Management. And Taylor's Scientific Management was all about measuring people and trying to get them to improve but basically measuring them a lot and telling them ways to improve, telling them how to do their jobs. This was primarily factory floor work, which in the 1910s was the majority of industry around the world, not where we are today when we talk about knowledge work. In the 1930s, we went to war, Second World War, and we started organizing like they organized the military. That's when we started to have managers and managers of managers and directors and vice presidents, etc. And the feeling was that the fewer people that made the decisions at the top, the faster the decisions could be made. In a world that's not moving very fast, that makes some sense. But our world moves much more quickly than that. In the 1950s, Peter Deming came up with the, uh, the, the cycle to do plan, then do it, then check it, then act on the results. Plan, do, check, act. There was also theory X, theory Y, which is what motivates people. Do they have to be motivated by being told what to do, or do they have to be motivated because they know what to do? Very big difference in those two. In the 70s, we started to have lean, lean manufacturing, primarily from Toyota. That is primarily what agility is based on, is how do we get a flow of value throughout our system. In the 1990s, we started to see agile software development come about. Now, this is agility at the team level. So how do teams create software and products more quickly? But now in the 2010s, we're beyond that. We have to start talking about agile organizations. How do we take that agility that's at the team level and make an entire organization agile? Because when we do, we unleash the potential of everyone and not just the select few. And the problem with today's model in agile software development is we're allowing teams to work in a different way, but doing everything else around them the same. And so nothing changes outside of the team, and yet they're held to those same standards, and it's not very helpful. So we have to do something different. Why does this matter to you? Uh, can we have our second question, please? The second question is basically, uh, who leads a scrum team? Is it the product owner, is it the dev team, or is it the scrum master? So what do you think? Let's hold up hands so we can get a kind of quick answer here. Who believes the product owner is the leader of the scrum team? Not too many of you. How about the development team? Are they the leaders of the scrum team? Some of you. How about the scrum master? Are they the leaders of the scrum team? So more of you. 
So interestingly, Agile changes everything because the answer is everyone is a leader. When you look at the Scrum diagrams, they always put all of those inside one circle. The Scrum team is a product owner, a Scrum master, and the development team working together, self-organizing to come up with a result. No one there is a leader. Everyone is both a leader and a follower. And that's why this is important for you to understand because all of you are leaders. All of you have to act like leaders because that's what's expected of you in agility. Uh, I read a study from Google. They looked at their 180 best teams around the world. And one of the interesting things they found for those teams was at the end of the day, every person on those teams had spoken about the same number of words. They were both leaders and followers, and they respected each other. And for those of you that are natural, introverted people, like most people in high tech, the number of words they spoke was greater than zero. Okay, so they did actually speak to each other, um, but they all spoke approximately the same number of words, which was interesting. Let's go back to the presentation now. This change from agile software to agile organizations is not happening overnight we have to change our entire paradigm of how we've done things. We have to think about some organizational shifts. How do we change our organizations from the old way to the new way? And the first one is to say, rather than focusing on value strictly for shareholders, can we focus on customer delight and having a shared purpose? So for example, in the United States, the uh, Fortune 500, many of those companies are international in scope, Many of them say maximizing shareholder value is a part of their value system. The problem with that is, what is shareholder value based on? It's stock price. What is stock price based on? Primarily profit, which is income minus expenses. If you are new to an organization and you are a new leader to that organization, is it easier to raise income or is it easier to lower expenses? It's almost always easier to lower expenses and the first thing you do is you start getting rid of people and, and departments. And as a result of that, your product quality generally decreases. Now you have higher profit for a period of time, which makes your stock price goes up, which makes your shareholders happy, but at the end of the day, you have unhappy customers. They're not gonna buy again, so your income goes down. Uh-oh, profit is decreasing, what do we do? We get rid of more people. It's a never-ending cycle. Now the other way is to say, let's make customer satisfaction our job one. And a company that did that is Zappos, ordering online shoes. Zappos has a very simple motto, make the customer incredibly happy. They sell shoes on the web. You wouldn't think that they would need to have a lot of phone support to do that. And yet phone support is one of their biggest things that they invest in. And they train their people, no matter what the question is, help the customer. So they have had uh, people on their telephone lines actually help a customer return a shoe that they didn't buy from Zappos. They got the other company on the phone on a three-way call, explained what was happening, and helped the customer return the shoe. If you were that customer, would you ever buy from another company other than Zappos after that kind of experience? Right? It just comes to show what they could do. They've also helped people who called them. They said, I don't know who else to call, but I need to order some food. Literally, the middle of the night in some place random in the country, and Zappos, the customer support person, got on the web, said, here are three numbers of pizza places that are still delivering. Feel free to have some pizza. But those are the kinds of things, those are the kinds of interactions that making your customer delighted are about. It's not about making sure they can follow your rules. It's about helping them solve their problems. And when we change our focus to customer delight, we start making better decisions about things. For example, uh, I often have companies that ask me, how do we figure out what the customer wants? And my response is, you shouldn't care. You don't ever want to build what they want. You want to build what they need. How do you find out what they need? You don't talk to them. You watch them. You interact with them. You help them do their job. You understand them at a core level. That's what shared purpose and customer delight is about, and it makes a huge difference in the way companies approach things. Another thing that makes an organization agile, 
We have come from a world where we are trying to predict and control everything. I personally wish the word estimate had never been created because it sounds highly scientific. At the end of the day, what is an estimate? It's a guess. If we had said it was a guess, people wouldn't expect it to be perfect all the time. And instead, that's kind of what they expect. And yet, we have trouble estimating anything. How do we know how long it takes to go from point A to point B on a road? We don't. We don't know if the weather's going to cause a problem. We don't know if there are accidents. We just don't know. And yet, at work, we expect to predict and control everything. The new paradigm in the 21st century is, let's run short experiments. Let's continue to experiment until we get the right answers. Let's not predict and control. Let's follow the evidence and get to the right place. And a company that does this very well is a company called Geonetric. They make uh, websites for hospitals and healthcare systems. And their CEO, Linda Barnes, who is on the screen behind me, she is fabulous at helping them be successful. They flattened their organization. In other words, they got rid of all of management. But they didn't get rid of management. They got rid of the title manager. The, everybody in the company is on a scrum team. And the scrum teams consist of sales, marketing, development, et cetera. They all have that on each team. So each team can handle a certain number of clients. And their mission is to make those people happy and to not be afraid to experiment. They understand they have a certain amount of profit and loss that is expected from their group, but each scrum team gets to manage that to maximize their own effectiveness. So it's an interesting experiment that they're running. Number three, I can't, um, can't even tell you how many times I go into a training and leaders tell me we want to be more efficient. You don't want to be more efficient. You want to be more effective. Uh, there's a famous quote from somebody, Peter Deming, I believe, who said, there is nothing worse than rapidly creating that which shouldn't have been created. Right? Don't build stuff you don't need. But we can do that very efficiently. In fact, have any of you, by a show of hands, have any of you ever worked really, really hard and at the end of the day got nothing done? Yeah. Stop doing that, okay? Right? We want to actually work less and deliver more value. And to do that, it means we have to be adaptable, and we have to engage more with each other, and we have to engage more with our customers. How do we understand how to build value faster versus build things faster? A company that does this well, actually the US Joint Operations Command uh, throughout the Joint Special Operations Command in Iraq and Afghanistan during the, the wars in the 90s and 2000s, 7,000 people had to communicate effectively to make those missions work. Uh, General McChrystal wrote a book about it called Team of Teams, and he explained what they did. He said basically every team had to understand every other team at some core level, and they had to have some engagement between those teams, and they had to understand that they, they were all on the same side. Because it was very easy for the special forces operators, the, the SEAL teams and those kinds of people, to say, oh, intelligence analysis? That's not, they, they don't do anything. But without the intelligence, how would they know where to go? And so they started to form cross-organizational cross bonds that made a big difference. And I believe in our organizations today, if we make cross-organizational bonds with other groups, we can get more things done quickly. Number four from directed groups to autonomous teams. We tend to have very top-down organizational structure, and we can't get anything done outside of our organizational structure. Burtzorg, a company in, I believe it's in the Netherlands, they have created a, a company with thousands and thousands of employees. I believe they have about 10,000 employees now, and their headquarters has less than 100. Every part of their company is an autonomous team that takes health care to a neighborhood. And they have 10, between 10 and 30 health care practitioners that, that manage that entire segment of their business. And so every group is autonomous. Every group knows what's expected of them. They have standards, but they're allowed to break those standards for the better of the client. So rather than being beholden to say, uh-oh, insurance says they can only have two days of care, they will say, it's OK. We can handle three or four days of care. It's up to us. Because they know that in other cases, they may not have to give two days of care. And so they are actually 
monitoring their clients in a very much different way because they're not about maximizing their ability to, in, to, to bill insurance companies. They're maximizing their ability to have people have a better life. Very different organization. Number five, from rigid hierarchies to human systems. There's a company called Morningstar. They're not a very fancy company. They process tomatoes. They create tomato paste and tomato sauce and pretty much anything you can do with a tomato. In the United States, at least, they have about 90% of that market. So if you ever go to the United States and you have something with a tomato in it, they've probably processed it at some point. And what they do that's different than every other organization is they say each team, and you can see a team on the screen behind us, each team figures out how to get their work done that day. They know what they're supposed to get done, they know what's coming in, they know the types of tomatoes, the types of products, and they figure out how to make that happen. No one from on high has to say, do it this way. Number five, this is one of my favorite ones. Rather than structured communications where you can only talk to your manager, who can talk to their manager, etc., we want to have what's called radical transparency. Everyone should know everything. A company that does this is Bridgewater. They take this to an extreme. They actually have all of their meetings recorded. Every meeting, every phone call is recorded. And the reason they do that is because they want everyone in the company to know what's happening at all times. And they actually have a rule that says, if you are mentioned in a meeting or on a call that you weren't in attendance, someone will send you a link to that recording so you can see what was said about you or for you. So you can, make a, you can understand what was going on. But it also means that they're transparent about their results. Who here is a developer? Do we have developers in the room? Right. So imagine for a moment that you're an average developer, not the awesome ones I'm sure you are. Imagine you're just average for a moment and that I am your project manager. Halfway through your project, I come to you and I say, uh, we're halfway done, and I need to put together a status report for management. What percent complete are you? Halfway through a project, what will every average developer in the world say? 50%, right? They don't even know what project I'm talking about, but they know 50% is the right answer. Is that being radically transparent and truthful? No. We get bad data, and we make bad decisions. So radical transparency is another shift. Number seven, we have so many complicated processes we follow, we have to simplify things. And a company that has done that really well is the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain. They have one basic rule. Make the customer ecstatic. That's it. Whatever you have to do to make the customer ecstatic is your job. They do all kinds of crazy things in their hotels. They have people who are concierges that will order a Rolex, Rolex watch. They will get tickets to events that are, you can't get a ticket to. They'll find a way to make their customer happy. That is their one overriding rule. And I believe in most of our organizations, we have way too many, way complicated rules. Number eight, let's talk about leadership at the end here this, of this section. Heroic leadership. That's when one person says, you all should bow down to me because I've done a good job. Well, that's silly, right? If they didn't have anybody doing the work, they wouldn't have gotten anything done. Transformational leadership, a company called Favi does this, uh, or did, under uh, Jean-Francois Zobrist. They, do, they uh, create brass parts for cars and other things. They're basically a machinery company. But they made a rule that said, we are going to all be leaders, and we're all going to make the best decisions possible for our company and for our customer. And they went from a company that was near bankrupt to a company that uh, was the, the only company, I believe, in their part of Europe that wasn't outsourced for those materials to China, because in China it's much cheaper. And they were never laid on a delivery for over two decades, including one delivery to Fiat that was in trouble. And the person in charge of that unit, because they have different units that do different things, the person in charge of that unit said, we can make this if we could actually use a Star Trek transporter and take the part which we just built and get it to Fiat in no time. And so somebody said, well, we don't have a transporter, but what if we helicopter it to them? 
So they literally rented a helicopter to deliver a part to keep their streak of getting things done on time alive because it was that important to their company to do that for their customer. Did they make money on those parts? No. But is Fiat a customer for life? Absolutely. These are some of the organizational shifts that we have to make in order to be more agile. And in order to do that, we need leaders who understand it. And so we need to go beyond the old paradigm. We had agile software development where we had mindset first, we wanted to have structure, we had a scrum team, we want to maximize value. All of these are good things, but we need to switch to a model, and those are certifications you can get. We, we need to switch to a model where we talk about agile organizations, and we need to do things like management innovation. Let's talk about innovation versus product. Let's talk about experiments rather than schedules. Let's talk a little bit more about how leadership is often a bottleneck. There are a number of uh, certified scrum trainers in the room, agile coaches in the room. Uh, all of us know the same thing. When we go into a company, it's not the team level that gives us resistance, it's the management layers. And let's make sure that that's exposed as a bottleneck so we can address it. And the Scrum Alliance is doing this with a couple of new certifications, the Certified Agile Leadership Credential 1 and Credential 2. And there's also something called Leadership Circle Profile. That is something that uh, is available to anybody around the world. You can take a leadership circle profile and find out how you perform as a leader, your tendencies both reactive and creative, personal and task oriented. It's an interesting concept, but we need to go beyond CSM, CSPO, CSD. Those are good, but not sufficient for long-term results. Peter Drucker wrote 39 books on management. And I love this quote. So much of what we call management consists of making it difficult for people to work. Right? We've all been there, right? A manager just makes things hard sometimes. In fact, I looked up manager on thesaurus.com. <laughs> Slave driver? Zookeeper? What is up with that? Right? It's craziness. Um, the world believes this is a manager. This is from Wikipedia. A manager should be able to do planning. Okay, get that. Organizing, I get that. Leading, that's a good one for a manager. Coordinating, I'm a little bit iffy on that one. But controlling? Why do we need to control things? How do we even do that? Right? This one is the one I just, I see that and I think, if that's what the world believes manager is, we're in a really bad place. Right? And here's the worst part about managers. And I'm speaking... I, I know that I'm stereotyping horribly. Not all managers are this way, so let's not, not, not take this to extremes. But they sometimes force something called a Hobson's choice on us. And a Hobson's choice works this way. You get to choose between A and B, and you lose whichever one you pick. So, okay, I can do this, and I can sell my soul to do it, or I cannot do it, and I can get fired. I don't really have a choice anymore. Both of those are bad outcomes. And that's what managers do to us sometimes is they force that kind of choice on us. A leader never would. And the language of organizational charts is not helpful. So I have a standard org chart here. And the way we read this in most countries is the person on the top manages those next two. Those next two manage the people below them. They direct them in some fashion. I believe if we turn the org chart upside down, we can change our language. In this, I have the same org chart, just flipped 180 degrees. The person on the bottom supports the success of the people above them. That next layer supports the success of the people above them. I think that's a better model for management, is understanding how to support success rather than direct. Set up a situation where people can be successful and let them strive for it. The terminology I like to use is the word champion. I go back to medieval times. This is a, a knight in medieval times. A champion fought for their kingdom. They did not tell their kingdom how to live. They fought for them tooth and nail to help them be successful. And so whenever I have people who are managers, I say, think of yourself as a champion instead. Let's imagine you're a development manager. Change that to development champion. Now, what does that mean? You don't tell your team what to do. You fight like crazy for them to be able to be successful. In other words, 
we're going to manage out and up. So if I go back a few slides to my org chart, rather than managing down, I want to manage the rest of my organization out here to allow my people to be successful. That is what a manager is supposed to do in the 21st century. Leadership is very different than management. I have met many managers who were good at management and terrible leaders. I have met many leaders who are terrible managers. They are not necessarily going together. But given the choice, I would go with a good leader over a good manager every time. And the reason is, is simple. Leaders influence. They don't tell. They help people understand why what they're doing is the right thing. And it's towards a shared goal. It's not my goal versus your goal. My goal is to make company for the, money for the company. Your goal is to make money for you. That's different than what we want to do for a leader. As a leader, our goal is to make really happy customers. Let's all devote ourselves to that. Leadership is about the goal and influence, and they don't, they're not tied together. There are seven traits I believe a leader should have, and so these are things that I believe all of us should try to practice in our daily lives at work. Number one, you have to be present. I don't care how cute a ghost you are, if you're a ghost, you're not going to be effective as a leader. People need to see their leader. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you have to be aware. You don't want to be off playing video games or doing Facebook while you're a leader because you need to be aware of what's going on. If you're not aware of what's going on, your people are going to be asking you questions and you have no idea what the answer is. Number three, you have to be engaged. You have to be part of it with them. A leader has to be present, aware, and engaged at the very minimum in order to be effective because if you're not engaged, people don't believe you're in it with them. Number four, you have to be honest. Right? Uh, these are from the US, obviously, but uh, Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, and uh, Richard Nixon uh, will just say he didn't tell the truth. And Pinocchio obviously didn't tell the truth. But if you're honest, you have a better chance to be a leader. I think you lose your leadership capabilities when you lie to people because now you've broken that trust that's required of a leader. Number five, you have to be curious. Knowledge isn't going to acquire you. You must acquire it. In order to do that, you have to be curious about what's going on around you. And the more curious you are, the more likely you are to have success. Number six, you have to let people try. This is my favorite quote from Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had a lot of really good quotes in his lifetime, but this is my favorite. The ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. So in 2001, 17 people got together in Snowbird, Utah with the idea they were going to change the world. And guess what they did? The Agile Manifesto came out of that meeting. We wouldn't be here today if those 17 people hadn't thought they could change the world. That's what leadership is. Leadership is saying, I'm going to stand up and do the right thing, and by the way, I think my way of doing it is going to change the world. Number seven, you have to empower people. They have to believe that they can be successful. A leader that says, we're going to try versus we're going to do, not so much, right? We, don't, we want to try, but we also want to have an idea that we can be successful. So empowerment is really important. Uh, can we put my next question up on the screen, please? So my next question is about, empower, or is about uh, agile organizations. I want to know a few things here before we move on. First, do you feel like you work in an agile organization? So that's a pretty good spread there, 42 votes. Um, I wasn't quite expecting that. Most people say that they're, they're only using it in areas, but uh, I like the fact that we have a quarter of you saying, yes, we're using Agile everywhere, including leadership. That's fantastic, fantastic. Can we put our next question up, please? The next question is about empowerment. And I'd like to see that one on the screen and whether you feel like your leaders are empowering you to make decisions that allow you to be successful. And that should have a yes and a no. 
But um, when I go into companies, I do two types of training primarily to get things kicked off. I do a, a leadership training where I ask leaders the question, do you believe you are empowering your workers to make decisions that allow them to be successful? And what answer do I always get from leaders? What do you think? Yes, they absolutely believe they're doing that. But the next day, when I go to the workers and I say, do you believe you're being empowered to make decisions that allow you to be successful? What answer do they always give me? No. Why do we have a disconnect between what leaders think and what workers think about empowerment? I struggled with this question for a long time. And then I started watching people actually empower others, and I realized the problem is primarily in the way that we're empowering people. So I want to give you a tool here at the, at near the end of my talk that will allow you to better understand empowerment and also do it from one side or the other, either be empowered or give empowerment better. And I call this the Empowerment Bill of Rights. And it has five steps, but I need to set it up by giving you an example of bad empowerment. So imagine for a moment that you work for me. And you come to me one day and say, Bob, we need to do either A or B. Which one should we do? And I decide that day of all days is the day that I'm going to empower you. And so I say, hey, you're good at this. Go for it. Does that make you feel empowered? Just think about your emotional impact of that. Would you feel empowered by, doing, by me doing that? Would you maybe feel a little fear? Would you maybe be worried about the result? Would you maybe be wondering why I'm suddenly giving you the opportunity to do this? Am I setting you up for failure? Does that feel like it's a successful situation? Probably not. So that's part of, but, but let's look at my perspective. My perspective as the leader, do I legitimately feel like I empowered you? I do. I told you it was yours to do. Therefore, I empowered you. So I feel like I empowered you, you didn't feel empowered. That, I think, is our problem. So here is my solution for it. I want to run the same conversation again, but then tell you what I did. So imagine, again, you come to me and we say, we need to do either A or B. What should we do? And my answer is, I start out the same way. I say, you're perfectly capable of doing this. You can choose between A and B. However, I don't want to spend more than $10,000, and I don't want to hire new people. And if I were thinking about it, I would go back to some decisions we made last year and see how those worked out on those projects. And lastly, before we do either one, can we come up with a quick experiment we can run so we can pivot if we need to? Now, after that conversation, would you feel a little bit better? I'm clearly giving you some guidance. I'm letting you make the decision. But it's safe now because we're going to run an experiment at the end to make sure we're going the right direction. So to me, that's much more legitimate empowerment because you feel safe about the empowerment. So the five steps. Number one, build the person up. I said, you were capable of doing this. Number two, frame their empowerment. You can choose between A and B. Number three, give them constraints. I don't want to spend more than $10,000, and I don't want to hire new people. Number four, give them initial guidance is what that says. I said, think back to last year, the projects we did, see how those decisions worked out. And lastly, help them test the result. Make sure we come up with a test that allows us to determine whether we're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Now, the circle here is probably going to come out in the wrong place. Um, but yeah, we, the test gives them safety. We want to make sure they feel safe through this interaction. Now, I call this a bill of rights because you should ask for these things if you don't get them. Let's go back to that first conversation. You go to your boss and you say, we need to do either A or B. And the boss says, you're perfectly capable, go for it. You could legitimately ask, are you saying I can choose between A and B? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Are there any constraints I should consider? Well, now that you mention it, I don't want to spend more than $10,000, and I don't want to hire new people. Could you give me some guidance based on your experience? Sure, 
I would probably go back to some things we did last year and see how those decisions worked out. Lastly, hey Bob, before, I do any, before we do anything, can we run a quick and dirty experiment so we can pivot if we need to very quickly? Sure, I recognize that things sometimes don't work out the way we expect. That sounds like a great idea. We save money by doing that. I didn't give you any of those things, but you got them. And to me, that's why this is really important, because it allows you to, it allows you to use this as both a leader and a follower. If I'm a leader, I want to empower people in this way. If I'm a follower, I want them asking for these things. I'll tell you a quick story about this because it, uh, it impacted me a lot. It's why I put it in all my classes now. Uh, May of 2016, I was at a client's site doing a leadership class for 30 of their leaders. And we did this segment and then we took a break. 29 people left the room and one gentleman had his head down on the desk and he was sobbing. He was crying. And I didn't know why. I thought something was wrong. So I went up to him and I said, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And he said, Bob, you just changed my life. I'm like, okay, what did I do? Right? He said, this Empowerment Bill of Rights is going to change my life. I'm not believing him. I'm like, okay, I don't get it. He said, no, you don't understand, Bob. I've been working here for 10 years and I love the people who work for me. I try my best to make them be successful and they all hate me. He said, I think I've been having that first conversation with them. I think I'm empowering them by saying, go for it. And then he said, I think I'm scaring the you know what out of them. And uh, he said, I think this is gonna change my life. And so I, I, I didn't believe him, first of all, but I, I didn't want to say that. I said, okay, whatever, let, let me know how it works out. And he said, Bob, trust me, I'm, I'm going to tell you I told you so when this makes me better. So flash forward seven months. The class was in May, actually eight months. In January of 2017, I got an email from him. It had the subject line said, I told you so. And in the message was a picture of him getting the Manager of the Year award from their CEO. It was a pretty defining moment for him. And I asked him what he did. He said all he did was he took a picture I had done this on a flip chart. He took a picture of the flip chart and he laminated it onto business card size things and gave one to everybody who worked for him and said, whenever you're being empowered, make sure you get all of these things, especially from me. So he made a huge difference in their lives. The reason he was given manager of the year was because the company was up uh, statistically about 2% year over year, but his group was up 23% year over year. So that's why he became manager of the year. I got another email from him three months ago, January of 2018. He said, I told you so again. 41 years his company has been in business. He is the first two-time winner of Manager of the Year. And he still tells me the only thing he did differently was this. But he went from a manager that people really didn't like, to, and people were literally leaving his team every month, to a manager where now he's getting applications for his team every week because people see the difference in what they can do. And I believe that that's just a story that illustrates when you let people take the power they have and use it for good, they do amazing things. And at its core, that's what leadership really is. How do we help each other do our best? Because too often in business, we're spending our time covering our own rear ends and not enough time helping each other. And helping is the mode of making people better and being a leader. Peter Drucker said it best. The leader of the past was a person who knew how to tell. The leader of the future will be a person who knows how to ask. When you're told what to do, it doesn't have the same impact as when you're asked what to do. I tell managers all the time, if you're not ending things with a question mark, you're doing it wrong. Ask people. Help guide them to the right place by questions. Powerful questions, other really good coaching techniques. But even on your teams, we spend a lot of times on our scrum teams telling each other facts and not enough times asking each other questions. 
I think we can do a lot better as leaders on our scrum teams if we learn how to lead by being side by side with our peers and doing it in a leadership style that makes sense. My company has a, has a lot of things that we try to do, but it boils down to the purpose of this presentation. We want people who work to have a purpose for everyone. We want them to have engagement for everyone. We want everyone to be able to be creative. We want everyone to be able to innovate. And we want to be able to create value for everyone. And I think, in a nutshell, when you take all that and put it in context, we're saying people need good leaders. And we're saying people need to be good leaders. Because if you are, uh, I envision a world where everyone likes to go to work. We're not there today. But if all of these things could happen, would people like going to work? I believe they would. And so thank you for your time this morning. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, I will be on the dev stage, I believe, answering questions after this. But uh, thank you for showing up this morning.